This is the first of a multi-part series exploring the use of the lab scope in automotive diagnostics. In this first video, we'll start with an historical introduction, followed by a demonstration of how to do a very fast indirect compression test using a picoscope. Good morning. Well, most of the people who watch my channel started fixing cars decades ago, and in those days, most of us were able to get by with a test light, a multimeter, and a healthy dose of common sense. Of course, in 1996, things changed when the OBD2 regulations came into effect. That required all manufacturers to give generic access to a diagnostic port for evaluation of emission control. Importantly, most companies used the same port for technical evaluation of other devices. Well, from there, a whole family of scanners was born. The cheap ones, like this one here by Autel, are read-only, sometimes faster, and if I just need to erase a code, I still use one of these. The more expensive scanners are slower, but they show live data with more codes and more detail. This one here is by Auto Ingenuity. It's the one I've been using, although it has its own limitations. I find it a little bit buggy. The best high-level scanners have more control capability, allowing you to use the PCM to turn devices on and off for diagnostic purposes. That's hard to bundle in a generic package, and it's a constantly shifting industry, and so ion devices need expensive and regular updating. Well, any mechanic will tell you, even a high-level scan tool rarely tells the whole story, and the algorithm of just replacing the part pointed out by the scan tool is often expensive and misdirected. This is where DIY efforts seriously derail. So even if you have a diagnostic trouble code, the experienced techs remember to verify their diagnosis. I find it so elegant to see how often this can be done with those classic old test tools, a test light or a multimeter, or in this case a power probe. But remember that some problems can be completely invisible to the PCM. And as cars become increasingly complex, we need to follow that with increasing complexity of diagnostic tools to keep up with this DIY automotive game. The bulky analog oscilloscopes of a past generation have now evolved into digital devices like this one, capable of storing and manipulating data. This little one has been my oscilloscope over the last few years, and it serves me well for electronics diagnosis. Ultimately, these things are simply a way of plotting measured voltage against time, and most have multiple channels to com compare one with the other. But often in automotive diagnostics, you need peripheral devices like this low amp current probe and this inductive pip up to measure what you need to know, and a generic oscilloscope by itself just isn't enough. Well, most of you guys know that to do a compression test in a V8 takes about an hour. I'm going to show you a very similar test that gives you almost as good a data in about 10 minutes using the Pico. To understand how current draw for a starter motor can be used to produce a relative compression test, you need to understand three simple concepts. When a DC series motor meets an increase in torsional resistance, it overcomes that resistance by generating more torque, and it gets energy for that torque by consuming more current. So you can estimate torque by looking at instantaneous current draw. Now if you consider one cylinder in a four-stroke engine, you'll realize that passive resistance to crankshaft rotation occurs at a very narrow phase of the engine cycle, at the end of the compression phase, when both valves are closed and the piston is moving upward. By comparison, resistance from other phases in the cycle consume very little, if any, energy. Now remember that all multi-cylinder engines are designed to stagger their current cycles for smoother function. This means that although starter motor current draw represents the sum of all sources of resistance, at any moment the bulk of that resistance is coming from a single cylinder. This means that if you plot starter motor current draw against time, you'll get a series of humps, the height of each hump being relatively proportional to the compression of that single cylinder. We're going to do this test with the starter motor with the car off, but we don't want the car starting when we turn the starter motor over. So I'm going to starve the throttle body of uh, fuel by pulling out the fuel pump relay now. Now at the moment the car is running, as I pull out the fuel pump relay, it's going to be starved for gas. And now there's no fuel and we're not going to start when we turn the starter motor over. Now I'm going to turn the vehicle off and we'll get started with the test. Okay, I've got the Pico loaded. Let me show you this. They've got some presets that make things really slick here. I'm going to go to automotive, charging and starting, and I want to do a relative compression test. And since they're from the UK, we use petrol. And watch what happens here. This loads up the presets so that the presets are set, and it gives you an example waveform. But look what's happening here. They've, um, if you've got an active website or an, a, a Wi-Fi connection, it uh, directs you right to a page which just walks you through how to do this test so you don't need to keep consulting the manual to do it. But let me show you how, the, how we'll do this. This is an example waveform. It's not the waveform I've set up. So my next step is I need to hook up my sensors. 
All right, this is the 2000 amp Pico uh, current clamp and it's got a standard BNC connector. We'll connect that to channel A. And then um, I'm going to set it at 2000 amps. You can see it's turned on and then I'm going to zero by pressing that button. Now I'm going to put it on how it's directional, the positive current going that way. And so uh, it's easy enough to hook up to the positive current lead here. If the positive is inaccessible, you can use the negative because the reality is the starter motor takes so much juice that it dominates any other electrical consumption. We're back at the screen and now we need to tell the um, software what probe we're using. It's not the 600 amp current clamp, it's the 2000. So we'll go down here and I've got it set at 2000 amp mode there. If we're using a 10 to 1 attenuator, uh, you click that in as well. So now it's, uh, we've told it what we're using for that um, channel. Okay, the next step is to put on an inductive pickup wire into one of the plug wires. Uh, these things come with the ground. You put the ground on first and then you put it on one of the plug wires. Now it doesn't matter which wire, but you don't want to know which one it is. This is plug number two. And I'm going to hook this up to channel B of the Pico. Now the reason we're doing this is so when we analyze the curve later, we'll be able to identify which, which um, cylinder is responsible for which hump of the curve. I'll show you that later. Now to set up channel B, I've chosen the secondary igniter. Um, this one right here, secondary ignition probe inverted. And make sure you turn it on. And I've down here I've chosen to trigger with none so that the screens roll through and I can pick out the best one later. Okay, we've got everything hooked up pretty well. Um, now make sure the fan belt's not going to catch any wires. Nothing's going to fall over when we bump the motor over. Let's turn it over now and see what we see. And first turn the unit off. Now, um, it stopped recording and it's recorded 23 screens. And so now I'm going to scroll back one screen at a time and just look for what I was recording. And there's a good screen right there. The Air is where we started. So this looks like the best one right here. We can manipulate it as, as we want. You can see that my current draw is um, pretty good right here. And all of the humps look um, symmetrical and equal. And so on a general um, basis, this um, test has passed. Um, you can see the spikes from cylinder number two. There's one right there, and there's one right there. And so um, let's um, print this out, and we'll spend a bit more time discussing uh, which cylinder is responsible for which hump here. Now uh, to save it, we go File, I'll Save, and um, I'm not going to Put, um, let's see, we'll do the recent vehicle as the Dodge Ram, and I'll save it there. All right, well, the nice thing about having the file up on a PC like this is that you can move it around and make it easier to see, and so I can move the whole scale up this way without changing the actual values, and I can actually even measure the values with this slider here. And so our readings are up here. This is um, Looks like the bottom amp draw is about 98 amps. And uh, if we look up here, the peak draw at the top is about 163 amps at the top. But more importantly, each of these humps looks about the same. So this one's a little bit smaller, but really not dramatically so. And so um, when you do a compression test in the manual way, in the usual way, you look for one cylinder to be way out of the ordinary compared to all the others. And if you do, then you identify that cylinder as having bad compression. On the positive side, we've done this test much more quickly. But on the negative side, we don't have actual readings with which to compare. Now, um, if you do have one cylinder that's a little bit out of the ordinary, then it's worthwhile pursuing which cylinder is that. So we've got one that's a little bit smaller here. You can see it's not just artifact because it's present in that one as well. Which cylinder is responsible for this hump? Well, we know that the um, spark plugs are for cylinder number two fired here and here and these are eight cylinders and so let's do a little arithmetic to find out which cylinder is this one here so. 
All right, my goal is to um, show you which part of the compression cycle we're dealing with. And to start that out, we're going to start with um, cylinder number two, which is the spark plug fires here and here. And as you know, it's two full revolutions of the crankshaft for, for every spark of one cylinder. And so, as you recall from the compression cycle, there are four phases to it. And as my friend Eric O uh, says, the best way to remember that is suck, squeeze, bang, blow. And th this one fires just a little bit before top dead center of the um, uh, bang phase. And so we're just going to move it here like so, and then put four little dots to outline. each of those. All right. Now let's draw some lines to divide that up. All right, well I went to the dealer's manual and this is the firing order for this engine. Two, one, eight, four, three, six, five, seven. So if we make the assumption that the bang is at the peak of the compression cycle, then this should be cycle number two, this cylinder number two. Two, one, eight, four, three, six, five, seven. Then we start again with two. And so the one that I find particularly interesting is this one. It's pretty close, but its compression seemed a little bit less than all the others. Let's pull the plug out on, on cylinder number four and have a look at that plug. And let's do the compression test with cylinder number four, or the, with uh, plug number four completely removed, so there'd be no compression there. Let's see what the curve looks like then. Now, while we've got plug number four out, let's have a look at this. Now, um, I'm not sure if you can appreciate this with the camera, but there's an interesting fragment right there that's crossing the boundary between the center pole and the electrode on the outside. It's just in this one pole here. All right, well, we're going to do the same test. Uh, this time the plug is out of number four, cylinder number four, and we'll see what contribution four makes to the curve. I don't like to do this for a long time, but a brief episode with the fuel pump relay pulled out shouldn't be a big issue. And here are the curves back to back. This is the curve with cylinder number four, the plug for cylinder four removed. It would have been right there. And you can see it lines up perfectly with the um, um, marker point for cylinder number two here, two, one, eight, and then a blank, three, six, five, seven. And so we verified that yes, indeed, this is the um, pressure point for cycle number two. We've lined them all up and we've taken num plug number four out. I'll be interested to see whether replacing in, uh, that plug number four makes a difference in terms of changing the slope of the curve. Well, I wouldn't expect uh, replacing a fouled plug to make a difference in terms of uh, compression. And indeed, the compression cycle is exactly the same with the new plug in place. That said, that uh, four cylinder is significantly abnormal. I'm going to explore that in more detail with secondary ignition waveforms. See, so, um, if you like this video, I think you're going to like the next one as well. It's uh, on uh, secondary waveform analysis using a lab scope to help with DIY diagnostics. Thanks for watching.